Good day, future doctors. So this is our third topic for Clinical Chemistry 2 lecture. I will be discussing the miscellaneous enzymes. And our topic will highlight the following enzymes. We have glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase or G6PD. We have the gamma glutamyl transferase or GGT. We have the 5 nucleotidase and acetylcholinesterase and pseudoacetylcholinesterase. We will first start with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. From the name of the enzyme, it's going to catalyze the removal of a hydrogen atom from glucose 6-phosphate. And when you remove hydrogen and transfer it to another chemical, the reaction is said to be an oxidation or reduction process. That's why glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is considered as an oxidoreductase. And that's the very reason why the first number in its enzyme nomenclature is number 1. Number 1 is assigned to an oxidoreductase enzyme. Now, take a look at the chemical reaction catalyzed by this enzyme. We have here the substrates glucose 6-phosphate and NADP. At the end of the chemical reaction, one of the hydrogen atoms of glucose 6-phosphate will be transferred to NADPH, converting now glucose 6-phosphate into 6-phosphogluconolactone or 6-phosphogluconate. I want you all to take note that in the process, NADP was reduced to NADPH, while glucose 6-phosphate was oxidized to become the 6-phosphogluconate. For you to understand the importance of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase in the body, let's have a summary of the process of glycolysis. In glycolysis, glucose will undergo several chemical reactions to become pyruvate. I want you all to focus on the first chemical reaction involved in glycolysis. You have there glucose acting with ATP in the action of the enzyme hexokinase, and one of the phosphate groups of ATP is transferred or will bind to the 6-carbon of glucose, converting glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. And that's basically the substrate of our enzyme, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. The point is, after its formation, glucose 6-phosphate may proceed to become the pyruvate molecule to complete the process of glycolysis. But this glucose 6-phosphate can also enter what we call pentose phosphate shunt. And the first reaction in the pentose phosphate shunt is catalyzed by glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Again, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase catalyzes the first step in the pentose phosphate shunt. And basically, that first step or first chemical reaction would involve the glucose 6-phosphate. Again, glucose will react with ATP. And with the presence of hexokinase, will form glucose 6-phosphate. This is the summary of the process of glycolysis. You have here glucose being converted to pyruvate. And in the first step, glucose is converted to glucose 6-phosphate. As mentioned a while ago, this glucose 6-phosphate may proceed to become the pyruvate or it may be involved in the pentose phosphate shunt and it is acted upon by glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Please remember the chemical reaction, glucose 6-phosphate plus NADP will give you 6-phosphogluconolactone or gluconate and NADPH. So this pentose phosphate shunt is very important in the generation of NADPH. So what's the importance of producing NADPH? Oxidizing agents can damage cells and tissues in our body. And what protects these cells from the effects of the oxidizing agents is glutathione. 
So in the process of protecting the cells and tissues, glutathione is oxidized by the oxidizing agent. That's why you can see in the chemical reaction, the glutathione will become the oxidized glutathione. And since we are exposed to these oxidizing agents every day, we need to reconvert the oxidized glutathione back to its reduced form so that it can continuously protect us from the presence of oxidizing agents. So how do we reconvert oxidized glutathione to its reduced form? Shown in this picture is the pentose phosphate shunt chemical reaction. We have here, let's start with glucose being acted upon by hexokinase, forming now glucose 6-phosphate. This glucose 6-phosphate is made to react with NADP in the presence of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, converting glucose 6-phosphate into 6-phosphogluconate, and NADP is reduced to NADPH. The reduced NADPH now will reconvert the oxidized glutathione to its reduced form. I want you all to imagine that there are people born with genes, abnormal genes that encode for glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So these people cannot express this enzyme. Thereby, they cannot produce NADPH and they cannot reconvert the oxidized glutathione to its reduced form. Thereby, these individuals are prone to the effects of oxidizing agents. And the condition is referred to as glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. There are a lot of tissue sources of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. You have the adrenal cortex, the spleen, the thymus, the lymph nodes, and even the mammary glands. But it's very important to memorize that this enzyme is present in erythrocytes. That's why it's stated in the second bullet, most of the interest of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase focuses on its role to our red blood cells. It protects our red blood cells from the damaging effects of oxidizing agents by producing NADPH. Let me read the third bullet. An adequate concentration of, of NADPH is required to regenerate sulfhydryl containing proteins. The most important one is glutathione from the oxidized to its reduced state. Glutathione in its reduced form protects hemoglobin of red blood cells from the effects of oxidizing agents. So a deficiency of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase will lead to inadequate production or supply of NADPH. And the consequence is there is the failure to reconvert oxidized glutathione to its reduced form. And these red blood cells now are prone to the damaging effects of the oxidizing agents. These oxidizing agents will particularly target the hemoglobin, causing it to precipitate as the Heinz bodies. These Heinz bodies can cause damage to the cell membrane, causing the red cells to undergo lysis. And these Heinz bodies will, will also cause the red blood cells to become less deformable. Remember, red blood cells pass through the spleen and for them to go out of the spleen, they must pass through small sinuses. And for them to do that, they must be able to deform their shape. The presence of Heinz bodies will affect the deformability of red blood cells, causing them to be trapped in the sinuses in the spleen. And these trapped red blood cells will be eventually destroyed by splenic macrophages. So people with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency will have hemolytic anemia. This is another picture of Heinz bodies. Glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency is an X-linked recessive disorder, meaning 
females will not manifest the disorder. Why? Because females have two X chromosomes. The normal X chromosome can compensate for the abnormal X chromosome. So this disease will only become symptomatic among males because males only have one X chromosome and the Y chromosome cannot compensate for the missing gene or abnormal gene in the X chromosome. The disorder can result to several different clinical manifestations, one of which is drug-induced hemolytic anemia. When you say drug-induced hemolytic anemia, there is destruction of red blood cells because of exposure to a drug. So most likely the drug has the ability to oxidize the hemoglobin in the red blood cells. And the most popular drug associated with hemolytic anemia in glucose phosphate dehydrogenase deficient individuals is the anti-malarial drug Primaquine. These are the other drugs that can also cause drug-induced hemolytic anemia to glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficient patients. But I will not require you to memorize them. But if you have relatives, friends, loved ones who have glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, please inform them that they should avoid taking these drugs because these drugs can cause hemolytic anemia episodes in patients with deficient glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme. Since G6PD is found in erythrocytes and its function is very important there, the sample that we should use in the laboratory is red cell hemolysate, meaning the red cells of the patient will be subjected to hemolysis. And the hemolyzed product should be tested for the presence of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And how are we supposed to know whether there is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme in the sample of the patient? Remember the chemical reaction. The final product is NADPH. So all we have to do is just what? Measure the light absorbance at 340 nanometer. Stated in the PowerPoint slide is the normal value for glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Please take note that G6PD deficiency is one of the diseases being screened in newborn screening program of our government. So as soon as the newborn is diagnosed to have this condition, the parents will be given list of food and drugs that they should avoid giving to the patient to lessen or prevent the risk for hemolytic anemia. The next enzyme is gamma glutamyl transferase. So from the name of the enzyme, we can already predict that it's going to transfer the functional group gamma glutamyl from the donor to another chemical or the recipient chemical. Now, I will read the first bullet. Gamma glutamyl transferase is an enzyme involved in the transfer of the gamma glutamyl residue. So let's take a look at the chemical reaction. The gamma glutamyl residue is the gamma glutamyl 3 carboxy 4 nitro anilide. And this gamma glutamyl will be transferred to an amino acid, water, or small peptides. When you say peptides, this are composed of chains of amino acids. Now, looking back on the chemical reaction, the gamma glutamyl is transferred to glycyl glycine. That's why at the end of the chemical reaction, you have the gamma glutamyl glycyl glycine and the 3 carboxy 4 anilide will be liberated. Since there is a transfer of a functional group, so therefore GGT is a transferase enzyme. So expect that the first number in its enzyme nomenclature is number 2. Please take a look at the photo on the right side of the screen. It is telling us that gamma glutamyl transferase can be found in the cytoplasm of the cell source. 
it can also be displayed on the cell membrane of the same cell or the cell can secrete the gamma glutamyl transferase in the serum. Now, what's the role of gamma glutamyl transferase? This gamma glutamyl transferase particularly acts on glutathione. So, the gamma glutamyl group of glutathione is transferred to an amino acid. So, I want you to take a look at the amino acid on the right photo. So, that amino acid there will receive the gamma glutamyl group from glutathione. And do you know the purpose of binding the gamma glutamyl to the amino acid? The presence of the gamma glutamyl bound to the amino acid will make it easy for the amino acid to be transported inside the cell so that that amino acid can be utilized to form proteins. So with the things that you learned from the discussion about the right photo, let's discuss now the functions of gamma glutamyl transferase which are elaborated in the left photo. Number one, peptide and protein synthesis because it will allow the cell to get the amino acid from the serum by allowing the amino acid to be transported across the cell membrane. And that's the importance, number three. And since this gamma glutamyl transferase will always use the glutathione as the source of gamma glutamyl, this gamma glutamyl transferase enzyme can regulate the tissue level of glutathione. So these are the tissue sources of gamma glutamyl transferase. So it can be found in the kidney, the brain, prostate, pancreas, and the liver. Particularly in the bile canaliculi of the hepatic cells of the liver. Take note, since it is found in pancreas, it can be elevated in acute pancreatitis. But the preferred analytes for diagnosing acute pancreatitis are the amylase and lipase. So in the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, we do not usually test for gamma glutamyl transferase. The most important tissue source that I want you to memorize for GGT is the bile canaliculi of the hepatic cells. So expect that GGT will be elevated in cases of bile duct obstruction. So what's the difference between GGT and ALT? Remember, ALT is also a liver enzyme. Both of these enzymes can be found in the hepatic cells and in the bile canaliculi. But I want you to take note that ALT is predominantly found in the hepatocytes. So that's why the arrow pointing to the hepatocytes is bigger than the blue arrow pointing the bile canaliculi. So ALT will give us an idea of a condition affecting the hepatocytes over conditions affecting the bile canaliculi. But in the case of ALP, alkaline phosphatase and GGT, they are more predominantly found in the bile canaliculi or the bile ducts than the hepatocytes. That's why conditions affecting the bile ducts will show increased levels of ALP or a higher increase in ALP or GGT than conditions affecting the hepatocytes. Both ALP and GGT enzymes can be used to diagnose cases of bile duct obstruction, but GGT is more specific to bile duct obstruction than ALP. Remember, ALP has a lot of rich tissue sources. It can be found in the bile canaliculi. It can be secreted by the osteoblasts of the bone. It can be found in the placenta, intestine, and in the kidney. So since GGT has lesser rich tissue sources, GGT is more specific to bile duct obstruction. So what's the point of knowing that? If you have both ALP and GGT to be elevated in the serum of the patient, then it's highly suggestive that you're dealing with the case of bile duct obstruction. But if the 
ALP is elevated but the GGT of the patient is normal, then that would tell us that the elevation in ALP could be because of the other tissue sources. The bone, the placenta, the intestine, or the kidney. Bile duct obstruction can be diagnosed by having the serum ALP and GGT of the patient tested. But if the patient who is manifesting the signs and symptoms of bile duct obstruction is a pediatric patient, and you know very well that their osteoblasts are active in depositing bony matrix, so expect that the ALP levels of this patient will be elevated. So to confirm that the ALP elevation is because of bile duct obstruction, it should be coupled with the result of GGT. This is also applicable in a case of a pregnant woman. Since she has a placenta in her uterine cavity, expect that her ALP will be elevated. So to diagnose bile duct obstruction, the ALP result should be backed up or coupled with the serum GGT level. Another important thing that I want you to take note is that GGT is found in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of the hepatocytes. And the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of hepatocytes functions to metabolize drugs and alcohol. And do you know what makes the smooth ER of hepatocytes very unique? In the presence of certain drugs, these drugs will cause the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of the hepatocytes to increase the production of certain enzymes. There are drugs that once introduced into our body will cause the smooth ER of the hepatocytes to increase its production of gamma glutamyl transferase. And these drugs include the following. We have warfarin, phenobarbital, and phenytoin. It's very important for us to take note that if our patient is taking these drugs, it is expected that their gamma glutamyl transferase should be elevated because the production of the enzyme is induced by these drugs and you call the process as hepatic microsomal induction. Usually, the increase is four times the upper normal limit. Do you know that alcohol is also a good inducer of the production of gamma glutamyl transferase in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of hepatocytes? So therefore, the serum GGT of chronic alcoholic drinkers are expected to be elevated. Most of the time, the serum level is two to three times above the upper normal limit. So with this information, we can actually use GGT to monitor the effects of abstinence from alcohol. So let's say for example, if you are managing a case of a patient who has been drinking for years, and you're helping the patient to stop drinking alcohol and the patient will promise you that he or she will try his or her best not to drink, expect that if the patient will stay true to his or her promise, that the levels of the GGT in his or her blood will drop or will return to normal within two to three weeks. So that if the patient will visit you again for another consultation, once you will have his or her GGT tested, expect that the GGT now will be within the normal level. But if the GGT of the patient remains elevated, that would give you an idea that your patient is still drinking alcohol. GGT levels are elevated in other conditions such as pancreatitis, diabetes mellitus, and myocardial infarction. 
So most likely, the source of the elevation of GGT in pancreatitis and diabetes is the pancreas, right? Because one of the tissue sources of GGT is the pancreas. But up to this point, the reason why GGT is elevated in AMI is still unknown. So how do we assay for GGT in the laboratory? The substrate is gamma glutamyl para nitro analyte. And the gamma glutamyl in the presence of GGT is transferred to glycyl glycine, liberating now the para nitro aniline. Take note, ha? Huh? If it is still bound to gamma glutamyl, you call it as para nitro aniline. But once it is liberated, it is converted into para nitro aniline. And once liberated, this para nitro aniline can actually absorb light at 400 to 450 nanometer. So how are we supposed to interpret this test? The higher the GGT in the sample of the patient, the higher the production of para nitro aniline. Therefore, the higher the absorbance of light at 400 to 420 nanometer. GGT activity is stable with no loss of activity for one week, especially if the serum is refrigerated. And we do not have to worry about hemolysis because it was not mentioned in the PowerPoint that GGT can be found in red blood cells. So stated in the PowerPoint slide are the normal values for males and females. Females generally have smaller or lower values of GGT because of the effect of estrogen and progesterone. So if these patients are taking warfarin, phenobarbital, or phenytoin, expect that their GGTs should be 4 times above the normal. So for males, it's 45 times 4. For females, it's 30 times 4. But if the male or the female patient is a chronic alcoholic drinker, just multiply the upper limit by 3. The next enzyme is 5-nucleotidase, and this is a hydrolase enzyme. So expect that it will break bonds with addition of water, and the number assigned as its class is number 3. The other name for 5-nucleotidase is 5-ribonucleotide phosphohydrolase. This enzyme will particularly act on a nucleotide. So in the chemical reaction, you have here a ribonucleotide. That's the reason why it's named 5-nucleotidase. Now, nucleotides have three portions. We have the phosphate, you have the sugar, and we have the nitrogenous base. Now, take note of the name 5-ribonucleotide phosphohydrolase. So meaning, this enzyme will separate the phosphate group or will break the bond connecting the phosphate group to the sugar with the addition of water. And when you remove phosphate from ribonucleotide, you are actually converting it into a ribonucleoside. And you have on as one of the products the liberated phosphate group. In this chemical reaction, we have here adenine monophosphate because you have one phosphate attached to the sugar group. And with the presence of 5 nucleotidase, it will add water into the chemical reaction to break the bond between the sugar and the phosphate, liberating now the phosphate group. So the nucleotide became a nucleoside. The nucleoside contains the sugar and attached to its first carbon is the nitrogenous base. The richest source of 5 nucleotidase is actually the liver. And similar to GGT and ALT, this enzyme can be found in the cytoplasm or displayed in the cell membrane of the bile ducts. So what's the importance now of testing 5 nucleotidase? Just like in the case of GGT, it will help us know whether the elevation in ALP is because of bile duct obstruction or other diseases involving the other tissue sources of ALP. Now, 
This enzyme, 5-nucleotidase, is also found to be elevated in ovarian carcinoma and rheumatoid arthritis. You really have to memorize those two by heart. Remember, the chemical reaction catalyzed by 5-nucleotidase involves the breakage of bond with the addition of water to liberate the phosphate group. And that is basically the same mechanism of action as alkaline phosphatase. So, if we will test the serum of the patient for 5-nucleotidase and if we will measure the liberated phosphate, we are also measuring the phosphate groups liberated by ALP. And the 5-nucleotidase result of the patient will be falsely high. And the patient might be misdiagnosed as a case of Baldock obstruction. So how do we solve the problem? Take note, 5-nucleotidase particularly acts on nucleotides. So, make sure that the chemical reagent that we'll use contains nucleotides with phosphate groups attached to them, but also add non-nucleotide substrates so that the ALP present in the sample of the patient will act on those non-nucleotide substrate, leaving now the nucleotide substrates to be acted upon only by 5 nucleotidase. Remember, both of these reactions, the ALP and the non-nucleotide substrate and the 5 nucleotidase and the nucleotide substrates will all form phosphates. Right? So, we will not focus ourselves in measuring the generated phosphate. Because if we will do that, we are measuring both the alkaline phosphatase and the 5 nucleotidase. Instead, we should measure the amount of nucleosides produced. Because the 5 nucleotidase will convert the nucleotide substrates into nucleosides. And the ALP will act on non nucleotide substrates. So the chemical reaction there will not produce nucleosides. So the amount of nucleosides in the chemical reaction will only reflect the activity of the 5-nucleotidase. The last but not the least, the acetylcholinesterase and the pseudocholinesterase enzymes. These enzymes break bonds with the addition of water. That's why they are considered as hydrolase enzymes. Let's talk about acetylcholinesterase first. Take note, this is the major neurotransmitter in our body. That's why you get to see high amounts of this in our central or peripheral nervous system, particularly on the neuromuscular junctions. And it's also important to take note that this acetylcholinesterase is also found in red blood cells. So red blood cells and the nervous system. Now, the function of this enzyme is to break down acetylcholine. Why is it important for us to break down acetylcholine? So, take a look at the picture of the nerve in the PowerPoint slide. This nerve is supposed to control another nerve or a muscle. And that this nerve will release acetylcholine. The released acetylcholine will act on the cholinergenic receptor or the acetylcholine receptor but the acetylcholine release will always be excessive that's why to prevent exaggerated response of the nerve or muscle to our primary nerve the excess acetylcholine should be metabolized or broken down and that is basically the role of the blue colored acetylcholinesterase so it will break down acetylcholine with the addition of water into acetate and choline. There's this another enzyme that can also break down acetylcholine or any choline ester, any chemical that has an ester bond with choline. But the thing is, this enzyme is not found in neuromuscular junction. 
So it doesn't participate in regulating the amount of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction or the synaptic cleft. This enzyme is produced by the liver and is secreted in the serum. And it's supposed to act on any choline ester, no? But scientists have been spending years, no? Trying to figure out what's the importance of having this pseudocholinesterase enzyme in the serum. But they cannot find an important physiological function. And since this is a cholinesterase that is secreted into the serum, it's not found in the CNS, it is sometimes referred to as plasma or serum cholinesterase. Take note of this. There are choline esters that this enzyme can act on. And these are the anesthetic drugs, the succinylcholine and mevacurium. These are muscle relaxants. They are used in general anesthesia to relax the muscles of the patient. These drugs are metabolized by the pseudocholinesterase enzyme in our serum. The absence of this enzyme will cause the action of these drugs to be prolonged. So just try to imagine the patient is supposed to have already the control of his or her muscle minutes or hour after the operation. But since the patient doesn't have the effect functional pseudocholinesterase enzyme, the action of the drugs will be prolonged. The organophosphates present in insecticides can irreversibly inhibit acetylcholinesterase and pseudocholinesterase. So if acetylcholinesterase is inhibited, it cannot anymore regulate the amount of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction. That's why you have here highlighted in red color, there is overstimulation of acetylcholine receptors, causing now the characteristic signs and symptoms of organophosphate poisoning. So these are the signs and symptoms of organophosphate poisoning. So to confirm a case of organophosphate poisoning, we need to test for acetylcholinesterase or pseudocholinesterase enzymes because they are irreversibly inhibited by the organophosphates in insecticides. Which among the two enzymes do you think can easily be tested because it is found in the serum? It's the pseudocholinesterase. So if the serum of the patient will show no pseudocholinesterase activity, then that will confirm organophosphate poisoning. You can also assay for acetylcholinesterase, but your sample is red cell hemolysate because acetylcholinesterase is found within red blood cells. Organophosphates in insecticides are irreversible inhibitors of both acetylcholinesterase and pseudocholinesterase enzymes. And since pseudocholinesterase is already available in the serum, it is preferred over acetylcholinesterase in terms of diagnosing cases of organophosphate poisoning. Aside from that, take note, pseudocholinesterase plasma activity falls before the acetylcholinesterase activity in red blood cells. So, plus, uh, serum pseudocholinesterase is more preferred than acetylcholinesterase. If someone is planning to work in a factory and his job description is to spray insecticides to plants to kill insects, the baseline pseudocholinesterase or acetylcholinesterase enzyme should be taken before the person is allowed to work. Take note of this. A decrease of 40% from the baseline is needed before the symptoms will develop. So even if the pseudocholinesterase and the acetylcholinesterase are within the normal range, as long as there is a drop of 40% from the baseline, 
the patient will start manifesting the symptoms. Severe symptoms will manifest if the values will drop more than 80% from the baseline. Since pseudocholinesterase is produced in the liver, expect that it will have a significant decrease in terms of its activity in patients with advanced cirrhosis or liver cancer. I will read the contents of this PPT and try to figure out if what I'm reading is making sense because we have already explained or discussed this a while ago. Pseudocholinesterase enzyme metabolizes the muscle relaxants, succinylcholine, and mevacurium. So therefore, any change in the pseudocholinesterase activity will have a corresponding effect on the action of these drugs. Succinylcholine is a skeletal muscle relaxant for intravenous administration indicated as an adjunct to general anesthesia for the anesthesiologist to easily facilitate tracheal intubation and to provide skeletal muscle relaxation during surgery. People with deficient pseudocholinesterase enzyme may not able to move or breathe on their own for few hours after the administration of succinylcholine or mevacurium. Affected individuals must be supported with mechanical ventilation because the muscles involved in respiration are also skeletal muscles and since these people cannot rapidly clear the succinylcholine from the blood, they need support. They need the mechanical ventilation to help them in the breathing process until the drugs are cleared from the body. Take note of this. This is very important. In normal individuals, 94% of the population, their pseudocholinesterase enzymes are inhibited by the drugs dibucane and fluoride. So if you are normal, your enzyme will be inhibited by dibucane and fluoride. 1% of the population have genetic variations in their pseudocholinesterase enzyme. Their enzymes are not inhibited by dibucane and fluoride. And take note, there is something wrong with their enzy enzyme. Their enzyme cannot metabolize succinylcholine. So let's have a summary. Normal individual, normal pseudocholinesterase should be inhibited by dibucane and fluoride but can break down succinylcholine. For 1% of the population, there is genetic variation in the enzyme. It is resistant to dibucane and fluoride and it cannot metabolize succinylcholine. That's why these people will experience prolonged apnea, meaning they cannot breathe on their own and they need assistance from mechanical ventilators. So how will you differentiate now this 1% of the population? You try to analyze the pseudocholinesterase activity in their serum after subjecting the sample to dibucane or fluoride. Do you know that we can also measure acetylcholinesterase enzyme in amniotic fluid to diagnose cases of neural tube defects? Neural tube is that embryonic portion that forms the brain and the spinal cord and for it to do that, it must completely closed. Failure to do so will lead to the exposure of the brain and the spinal cord from the body of the fetus. So if the brain and the spinal cord are exposed from the body, there is leakage of acetylcholine from the central nervous system to the amniotic fluid. Examples of neural tube defects are the following. We have spina bifida and an encephaly. So how do we assay for acetylcholinesterase and pseudocholinesterase in the laboratory? The sample for pseudocholinesterase is the serum. The sample for acetylcholinesterase is the red cell hemolysate 
or the amniotic fluid. Now, the sample is made to react to the substrate acyl thiocholine. Now, what will happen is there is a breakage of bond with the addition of water. Acetic acid is separated from thiocholine. So, just take a look at the chemical reaction in the photo. This thiocholine will react with the Elman's reagent, which is composed of dithiobis-nitrobenzoic acid, the DTNB chemical labeled in the photo. So that's the Elman's reagent. And thiocholine with dithiobis-nitrobenzoic acid will cause the formation of 5 thio 2 nitrobenzoic acid which can absorb light at 410 nanometer to 440 nanometer. So how we should interpret this test? The higher the acetylcholinesterase in the red cell hemolysate or amniotic fluid or pseudocholinesterase in the serum of the patient, the higher the amount of 5 thio 2 nitrobenzoic acid product. So therefore, there is a higher absorbance at 410 to 440 nanometer and that ends my lecture for the miscellaneous enzymes thank you very much for listening